All right, we are going to continue with chapter six. There are 12 chapters in the first half of this book, in part one of this book. So what we are going to do is we're going to finish reading chapter six, and then we're going to take a break and do kind of a brief project to help give us something to do with the knowledge that we've acquired and maybe make it a little bit easier to understand. I don't know about you, but usually when I do something a little bit more hands-on, it helps ideas sink in with me. Yes, said our father when Jim asked if we could go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fish pool with Dill, as this was his last night in Maycomb. Tell him so long for me, and we'll see him next summer. We leaped over the low wall that separated Miss Rachel's front yard from our driveway. Jim whistled Bob White, and Dill answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jim. Look yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Maudie's pecan trees. It makes it seem hotter, he said. Cross in it tonight? asked Dill, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from newspapers and string. Nope, just a lady. Don't light that thing, Dill. You'll stink up this whole end of the town. There was a lady in the moon in Maycomb. She sat at a dresser, combing her hair. We're gonna miss you, boy, I said. Reckon we better watch for Mr. Avery? Mr. Avery boarded across the street from Miss Henry Lafayette DuBose's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until nine o'clock and sneezed. One evening, we were privileged to witness a performance by him, which seemed to have been his positively last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jim and I were leaving Miss Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stopped us. Golly, look yonder, he pointed across the street. At first we saw nothing but a kudzu-covered front porch, but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and splashing in the yellow circle of the streetlights, some ten feet from source to earth, it seemed to us. Jim said Mr. Avery misfigured. Dill said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuing contest to determine relative distance and respected prowess only made me feel left out again, as I was untalented in this area. So if you're having trouble piecing together what's happening, uh, Mr. Avery is standing on his front porch, peeing into his yard. So. Dill stretched and yawned and said all together too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody in Maycomb just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his hand in a southerly direction. Jim said, okay. And when I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come along, Angel May. You don't have to go, remember? Jim was not one to dwell on past defeats. It seemed the only message he got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scout, we ain't gonna do anything. We're just going to the street light and back. <laughs> yeah, okay, sure. We strolled silently down the sidewalk, listening to porch swings creaking with the weight of the neighborhood, listening to the soft night murmurs of the grown people on our street. Occasionally, we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jim. Why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you gonna do? Dill and Jim were simply going to peep in the window with a loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Boo Radley, and if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat, flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Because nobody could see them at night. Because Atticus would be so deep in a book he wouldn't hear the kingdom coming. Because if Boo Radley killed them, they'd miss school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark than in the daytime. Did I understand? Jim, please. Scout, I'm telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord you're getting more like a girl every day. With that, I had no option but to join them. We thought it was better to go under the high wire fence at the rear of the rally lot. We stood less of a chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jim held the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up the wire for Jim. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a row of collards. Whatever you do, they'll wake the dead. With this in mind, I made perhaps one step a minute. I moved faster when I saw Jim far ahead, beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the garden from the backyard. Jim touched it. The gate squeaked. 
Spit on it, whispered Dill. You've got us in a box, Jim, I murmured. We can't get out of here so easily. Shh, spit on it, Scout. We spat ourselves dry, and Jim opened the gate slowly, lifting it aside and resting it on the fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Radley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors. Instead of a column, a rough two-by-four supported one end of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in the corner of the porch. Above it, a hat rack mirror caught the moon and shone eerily. So this is not a, a, a vocab word, but it is something that we want to take a look at. And now what a Franklin stove is. Hop over to images here. And there we go. So this is a Franklin stove sitting on the corner of their porch. Ah, said Jim, softly lifting his foot. Smatter. Chickens, he breathed. That we would be obliged to dodge the unseen from all directions was confirmed when Dill ahead of us spelled out G-O-D in a whisper. We crept to the side of the house, around to the window with the hanging shutter. The sill was several inches taller than Jim. Give you a hand up, he muttered to Dill. Wait, though. Jim grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist, and I grabbed his left wrist and Jim's right wrist, and we crouched, and Dill sat on her saddle. We raised him, and he caught the windowsill. Hurry, Jim whispered. We can't last much longer. Dill punched my shoulder, and we lowered him to the ground. What'd you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a little teeny light way off somewhere, though. Let's get away from here, breathed Jim. Let's go, round in the back. Shh, he warned me as I was about to protest. Let's try the back window. Dill, no, I said. Dill stopped and let Jim go ahead. When Jim put his foot on the bottom step, the step squeaked. He stood still and then tried his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jim skipped two steps, put his foot on the porch, heaved himself to it, and teetered a long moment. He regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head, and looked in. Then I saw the shadow. It was the shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing, and tree trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight, and the shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch toward Jim. Okay, so we're going to pause here. Sorry to uh, break the tension, but we need to make sure that we get some notes down. So we're going to look here at the key events. So, kids, sneak over to the... Bradley House to try to find Boo. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have that because that's a pretty important event in this chapter. Bill saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jim, Jim saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. A shadow stopped about a foot beyond Jim. Its arm came out from the side, dropped, and was still. Then it turned and moved back across Jim, walking along the porch and off the side of the house, returning as it had come. Jim leapt off the porch and galloped towards us. He flung open the gate, danced Dill and me through, and shoot us between the rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards, I tripped. As I tripped, the roar of a shotgun shattered the neighborhood. Dill and Jim died beneath me. Jim's breath came out in sobs. Fence by the schoolyard, hurry, scout! Jim held the bottom wire. Dill and I rolled through and and we're halfway to the shelter of the schoolyard solitary oak. When we sensed that Jim was not with us, we ran back and found him struggling by the fence, kicking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave way to numbness, but Jim's mind was racing. We gotta get home, they'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to deer's pasture behind our house, climbed our back fence, and were at the back steps before Jim would let us pause to rest. Respiration normal. The three of us strolled as casually as we could to the front yard. We walked down the street and saw a circle of the neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, said Jim. They'll think it's funny if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Radley was standing inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Maudie and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery were nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased in beside Miss Maudie, who looked around. Where were y'all? Didn't you hear the commotion? 
What happened? asked Jim. Mr. Radley shot at a Negro in his collar patch. Okay, so let's pause here real quick. So we've got a couple bits of information. So first of all, we have a bit more information on our presumptive justice system. So uh, Mr. Radley, without any evidence, assumes that the person who was in the back must have been somebody who was black because of the stereotype that they have about black people. Let's put this in our notes. Nathan Radley shot at the kids and they ran. Mr. Uh, Jim lost his pants. So over here in the notes, we're going to put We're going to put the neighbors assume so neighbors assume a black person was trying to steal from them. Because again, we have this idea, this stereotype that all black people are criminals, which was especially prevalent back then. Um, so we want to keep that in mind because that, that kind of mindset is going to strongly influence the way that they treat people later. Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. Says if anybody sees a white nigger around, that's the one. Says he's got the other barrel waiting for the next sound he hears in that patch, and next time he won't aim high. Be a dog, nigger, or... Jim Finch! Ma'am, asked Jim. Atticus spoke. Where are your pants, son? Pants, sir? Pants. It was no use. In his shorts before God and everybody, I sighed. Uh, Mr. Finch, in the glare of the streetlight, I could see Dill hatching one. His eyes widened. His fat cherub face grew rounder. What is it, Dill? asked Atticus. Uh, I won them from him, he said vaguely. Won them? How? Dill's hands out the back of his head. He brought it forward and across his forehead. We were playing strip poker up yonder by the fish pool, he said. Jim and I relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. What was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like the town fire siren. Do Jesus, Dill Harris, gambling by my fish pool. I'll strip poker you, sir. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel, he said. I've never heard of them doing that before. Were y'all playing cards? Jim fielded Dill's fly with his eyes shut. No, sir, just, just with matches. I admired my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Jim, scout, said Atticus. I don't want to hear a poker in any form again. Go buy Dill's and get your pants, Jim. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry, Dill, said Jim as we trotted up the sidewalk. She ain't gonna get you. He'll talk her out of it. That was fast thinking, son. Listen, you hear? We stopped and I heard Atticus's voice. Not serious. They all go through it, Miss Rachel. Dill was comforted, but Jim and I weren't. There was the problem of Jim showing up some pants in the morning. Give you some of mine, said Dill as we came to Miss Rachel's steps. Jim said he couldn't get in them, but thanks anyway. We said goodbye and Dill went inside the house. He evidently remembered he was engaged to me, for he ran back out and kissed me swiftly in front of Jim. Y'all right here? He bawled after us. Had Jim's pants been safely on him, we would not have slept much anyway. Every night sound I heard from my cot on the back porch was magnified threefold. Every scratch of feet on the gravel was Boo Radley seeking revenge. Every passing Negro laughing in the night was Boo Radley loose and after us. Insects splashed against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wires to pieces. The chinaberry trees were malignant, hovering, alive. So let's pause. Let's get that vocab word since we don't have a whole lot for this chapter. So we can kind of deduce a little bit by looking at this root here, mal. Mal would be Latin for bad, kind of like bene is Latin for good. So malignant, malevolent which doesn't help us a whole lot if you're unfamiliar with that. So why don't we look here at our synonyms? So we have hostile, uh, spiteful, malicious, uh, all different words that mean evil or bad or intending harm.
I lingered in between sleep and wakefulness until I heard Jim murmur. Sleep, little three eyes? Are you crazy? Shh, Atticus' light is out. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jim swing his feet to the floor. I'm going after him, he said. I sat upright. You can't. I won't let you. He was struggling into his shirt. I've got to. You do, and I'll wake up Atticus. You do, and I'll kill you. I pulled him down beside me on the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's going to find him in the morning, Jim. He knows you lost him. When he shows him to Atticus, it'll be pretty bad, and that's all there is to it. I went back to bed. That's what I know, said Jim. That's why I'm going after him. I began to feel sick. Going back to that place by himself, I remembered Miss Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard. Be it nigger, dog, Jim knew that better than I'd. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jim. A licking hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shot off, Jim, please. He blew his breath patiently. I. It's like this, Scout, he muttered. Atticus ain't ever whipped me since I can remember. I want to keep it that way. This was a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. You mean he's never caught you at anything? Maybe so, but I just want to keep it that way, Scout. We shouldn't have done that tonight, Scout. It was then, I suppose, that Jim and I began to part company. Sometimes I did not understand him, but my periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded. Can't you just think about it for a minute? Be by yourself on that place? Shut up. It's not like he'd never speak to you again or something. I'm going to wake him up, Jim. I swear I am. Jim grabbed my pajama collar and wrenched it tight. Then I'm going with you, I choked. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held it while he crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The moon was setting and the latticework shadows were fading into fuzzy nothingness. Jim's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled the sweat running down my sides. He went back through Deer's pasture, across the schoolyard, and around the fence, I thought. At least that was the way he was headed. It would take longer, so it was not time to worry yet. I waited until it was time to worry and listened for Mr. Radley's shotgun. Then I thought I heard the back fence squeak. It was wishful thinking. Then I heard Atticus cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we made a midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom, we would find him reading. He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on, straining my eyes to see it flood the hall. It stayed off, and I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired, but ripe china berries drummed on the roof when the wind stirred, and the darkness was desolate with the barking of distant dogs. There he was, returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. Wordlessly, he held up his pants. He lay down, and for a while I heard his cot trembling. And then he was still. I did not hear him stir again. Okay, so this is a very important chapter in the story. We have a milestone here set for Jim. We know that we have milestones set for Scout. One of them was her first day of school, one of those things that show that you're growing up. Here we have Jim demonstrating one of the things that we expect adults to be able to do, which is to take responsibility for your actions. Now, the argument uh, it has merit of should he have gone back knowing the danger that he was in to get his pants or should he have owned up to what he did? But the idea here is that he honestly made that decision based on what was inside, based on his beliefs and his morals and his convictions. This is an important part of what we are about to do. So keep this stuff in mind with the project that we are about to complete.